Hello, everyone. Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. And this is the week in charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Actually, I didn't update what we're going to talk about, so we'll get we'll get to that. Obviously, current market conditions. Instead of how to fail at trading, I'm going to cover some ways to succeed. I want to talk about the buy it be day one rule. Getting some questions on that, so I really want to try to clarify that best I can tonight. I want to talk about where the money is, and that's in the longer term trading. And there's a few other things I'm sure I'm forgetting. <laughs> Anyway, what a uh, lame inter introduction. Uh, that's there's a disclaimer screen. I promise this is good stuff. Just wait. <laughs> no, I'm going to talk about how to succeed at trading as opposed to how to fail at trading. Focus on the fact that one simple pattern might be all you need. Some of the stuff we covered in stock chart show. And again, that'll make sense. All predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can have between now and then. That's a short version of the disclaimer screen, and that's from my buddy Greg Morris. All right. I normally do the mystery charts and methodology in action over in stock charts, but lately I've been doing some of that over here too. And I want to do a dead money report. Now, some of this comes straight from my stock chart show, so I'll go through it kind of quickly. But this was where I was recommended a while back, and it was a Landry like pullback. And I'm going to talk about those in a few minutes. And Landry like pullback is basically you get about 20 bars, and when I say about when I'm talking about things, I'm not a purely mechanical trader, although I do like to show you patterns that are somewhat mechanical, just in case you're new or newer to my methodology or new to trading. And these, something like a ledger like pullback is easy to scan for and also easy to recognize. And that's why I like patterns like that. Now, as I'll get into in just a few minutes, you have to learn how to pick the best and leave the rest. But as a general statement, if you have acceleration and all the things I look for and the trend qualifiers, such as wide range bars in the direction of the trend, you have a nice deep pullback. And in this case, to the 30 EMA, all those things kind of set up nicely. Now, before I get sidetracked too far. So, again, it was a Landry light pullback and those were the parameters down below entry of 1210, protective stop of 850, initial profit target of 1570. And if you remember, DaveLearner.com, this spreadsheet is behind the firewall. Actually, I think it's also available to the to the public. You might you might be able to go to DaveLearner.com slash members resources. And I'll put the, the exact link in the comments below for the YouTube. Anyway, entry was here. Stop was down there. Initial profit target is basically the risk, which is entry minus the protective stop. That gives you the risk, and you add that to the entry. I'm getting some questions on that, especially on YouTube. And basically, what's kind of cool is you just need to figure out where you're going to get in and where you're going to place your stop, and everything else is filled in for you on the spreadsheet. Because, again, the initial profit target is simply the risk, which is – the entry minus the stop plus the entry. So if you're risking, let's just say three points round numbers make the math easy, then you'd be looking to take profits at 15, 10. But these were the parameters that I put out and I'll show you where to find these in a few minutes. So that's the initial profit target or IPT for short. And notice that this thing just died. It triggered and then it died. And the question becomes, is this dead money? And dead money, just paraphrasing, I think it's investopedia.com or something, says it's uh, money that has little or no chance of becoming, uh, making any money off that money. Well, you don't know that, okay? And you're much better off following a plan than breaking the plan just because the market is, is not doing as you hoped. So if you can follow methodology longer term, you just you're better off just not micromanaging, letting things shake out. Could this thing have stopped out? Absolutely. Am I interviewing myself? Yeah. But the one or two that take off make it all worthwhile. And you can see in this case, fortunately, knock on wood, it did take off, hit the IPT. So that's a thousand dollars banked. This is based on a hypothetical 100 k account. I did take this trade. I think I showed the trades in the last. 
time I did a, a, a webinar, but I'll get the trades for you to show you. I do have an account. I take it in more than one account, but I have a model account where I take the exact number of shares so I can show you that I actually took the trade. In a lot of cases, I'll round up. Anyway, so 1,000 banked, 2138 open. So this is what I would consider not dead yet. Reminds me of the Python boys. So 2138 plus 1,000 banked comes to 3138. So you can see following the plan is the thing to do longer term. This is within the methodology. This is my methodology. Maybe you have a different methodology where you have a time uh, a time stop or something. You just get out after so many days. That's fine. But longer term, I find you're better off sticking with position as long as, 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 as it doesn't do anything wrong. And by not doing anything wrong, I mean not stopping you out. Now, shifting gears, Tom Petty got it right. The waiting is the hardest part. So on 5-3, I received this email. And again, some of this is was also in my Trading Simplified show. But these are two different audiences, and plus I wanted to flesh this out a little further. I decided I want to cancel membership. I have learned a lot from your service, but at this time, I want to try a different service. Thanks, Rick. And I thought about that overnight. I checked my email, I think that night, next morning. I said, I woke up thinking that the next guy with a different service is going to look like a genius, if he's a trend follower, of course. And that's because we were due to we were due for some big winners slash the markets due to trend again. Okay, so basically trading is a lot of waiting. Although trading is an active verb, the real money is in the longer term trends. And the way you you get to that real money is you wait and you wait and you wait, and you spend a lot of time sitting on your hands. Now a lot of people are interested in action, and I get that, but I'm not here to provide you entertainment and action. Well, hopefully I'm a little entertaining, but <laughs> I want to try to find you setups that work. And sometimes that means sitting on your hands. Anyway, so on 5.3, this was a portfolio going into 5.3. So the service is filmed the night before. So this is what it looked like. And this is what it looked like when I received the email. We had one stock in the portfolio, Riot, and we had one setup, SYM. So you can see the portfolio not doing so hot down $233. And the SIM trade triggered, hit the IPT, and subsequently stopped out for a gain of 3500 Now, I took the snapshot of the portfolio right after the close today. And I just want to show you this SIM down here. This is a new trade. We actually went back to the well and i think i have this chart in a few slides and i'll show you how we went back to the well on that one now you can see knock on wood again the open profits were 66.30 now that includes this two thousand dollars in closed trades i show the closed trades as long as the other part of the trade is on so you can see the entire trade but it's easy to kind of like mentally take it out if you want to. So the open profits technically 46.30, but we did take partial profits on these two. And by the way, the QBTS was a near miss today or close enough for government work. We're looking for 270 as the initial profit target. And it ended up closing at 262. And when it was around 260, I put out a post in, in my Facebook group, not to split hairs and the real money is in the second loaf. We don't have any huge winners in here, but 22.78 since April, almost May. That's better than the poke in the eye, right? And the ultimate goal is just keep riding these trends as long as they keep on keeping on. So that's okay. That's a decent little profit. This is a little decent little profit too with BTBT. But anyway, so if we went from minus 233 to 6630 plus remember we made 2500 or was it 3500 in the um might have been 3500 yeah 3500 oh okay so I'm off by a thousand so 3500 so 
from minus 233. So that's 10,363, and it's actually 11,363. And that's just since May 2nd. So that's a little bit over two and a half months, so right around two and a half months. And that's pretty good, and and that's that's about as good as it gets. If I did that all the time, you would never see my fat ass again. <laughs> Believe me, there's a lot of waiting in between, and that's the that's the hard part about this game is you wait, you wait, you wait, and right about the time you're getting ready to give up, bam, you knock it out the park. Anyway, if you want to see these archives, you can see them for free at DaveLearner.com/archives. It's a great exercise, if I say so myself. I'm not sure if anybody bothers doing it because I get a lot of questions about a lot of stocks. And I think if you would just go in, if, if I say so myself, and look at these archives, you would get a pretty good idea where I'm coming from as far as my stock picking is concerned. And of course, if you watch these week of chart shows, you'd have a pretty good idea too. And then come come to the shows live, davelander.com slash webinar. Bring your stock picks up and we'll noodle with them a little bit. And what we've been doing lately, quite a bit, in the Facebook group, which you do have to be a member of DaveLearner.com for that. You have to be a paid member. The group is free, but that's one of the benefits. You get an invite when you join DaveLearner.com as a paid member. Anyway, the group has been really great. And a lot of the, the newbies coming into the group, they bring up stocks and we talk about them and that's how you get better and better and and i was telling one gentleman earlier who's a little newer to my methodology he says oh i must be your slowest student i'm like no no you're doing fantastic because you're bringing up stocks and then you you go back and you regroup a little bit then you try again and it's like no this one has overhead supply and if you keep showing me stocks with overhead supply like i told him i said i'm probably gonna give you a little bit of tough love one of the things that i didn't do Earlier in my career with the educational business was I coddled everybody too much, if that's the word. Is that the right word? And I didn't I didn't let them I, I let them keep making mistakes and didn't come down hard on them for making these mistakes. So in more recent years, I've been giving people a little bit more tough love, and I think it begins to work. It's like stop showing me stocks with so much overhead supply. It's like it's right here. This is overhead supply. Okay, I got that. Now show me something that has some other problems, and that's fine. But that's how you learn. So don't don't be stressed out. If I don't like anything you show, eventually I will. I can guarantee you that. Anyway, getting some questions about the, the day one rule. And things are real simple in my mind, super simple, but sometimes I don't do a good job of conveying them. So let me just let me just show you this. And I rewrote it. I did not take this trade, by the way. We were talking about this in Facebook. And I decided to pass. I thought the range was a little small, although it does appear to be working. I just didn't like the range on it. I thought the range for the first few weeks of trading could have been a little bit bigger, maybe showing a little bit more excitement as an IPO. Now, doesn't mean that I won't ever trade this. If this stock continues to rally, then I'll trade that first pullback. So the point I'm trying to make there, I'm just kind of backing into something, is that I won't... I'm a little bit more, um, what's the word? A little bit more restricted or, or um, let me just start that over. When, when an IPO first comes public for a pioneer type of pattern, buy at B means you could be buying, if it comes public on Monday, you could actually be buying on Friday's close, okay? If it sets up just right. And that's the earliest I'll get into the IPO. And then, and, you know, I get tempted every now and then when there's a hot IPO coming out, but I just, work really hard to sit on my hands and not do anything until day five. Now that's what I consider the buy is a pioneer type of pattern because it'll get you in really, really early. And that's really where the money is getting these IPOs really early. Sometimes, and I'm not confusing the issue with facts, but like when Academy came out, ASO, I didn't take the buy at B or, the, or any other pioneer setup that I might be looking at, meaning early on, I waited, until it did a secondary setup, like a first pullback. And that's sort of what um, there's one we're looking at now. Oh, it's it's the law. It's the setup for tomorrow is a first pullback, and I'll show you that after it triggers. But anyway, so the day one rule, I decided to to rewrite it tonight, right before I went live, just so it makes a little bit more 
sense because I got to thinking about it. What happens if day five is higher than day one? That does not necessarily negate the day one rule, okay? And to make that more clear, I rewrote it as follows. If bar one, the first day comes public. Now, forget about if you pull up these stocks on stock charts. I actually, if you look really hard, you might be able to see it. I actually erased the little bar that shows the pre-market trading or pre-IPO trading, okay? So it's, let's say it's it's supposed to come public at 20 and then it opens at 22. I don't worry about those type of numbers. I don't worry about that. Maybe there's something there to flesh out, but I haven't found anything. I want to see how it's going to act in real markets. But anyway, day one is the first day it actually trades on the exchange. So if bar one is higher than bars two through four, okay, or the flip side, if bar two, three, four is higher than day one, then the day one rule is no longer in effect. Anyway, if bar one is higher than bars two through four, then the stock must close above bar one on day five or beyond to trigger. Now that sounds complicated, but it's really, really not. So ATMU, this is day one, okay? So that's our high. Day two, it's not exceeded. Day three, it's not exceeded. Day four, it's not exceeded, okay? So a day five or beyond normal buy without the day one rule would be this close here because that's the highest close for the first week of trading. And any close above that would be a buy. So that's a normal buy there. However, because day one set the high, for the first four days, I guess that's a, a good way of putting it. I used to say day one sets a high for the week, but then I realized that's confusing because let's say it comes public on Monday. If Friday's high is higher, that day one rule is still in effect if that set the high so far. Anyway, so you would actually buy above the day one high in this particular case. Now, just pretend that, and I modified this chart so it would work, but just pretend that day one high is there, and then on day two, let's assume the high was way up here. So day two took out the day one high, so the day one high rule is no longer in effect. And then there's day three and day four. So what's the highest close so far for the week? Well, it's right there. So any close above that high would be a buy, okay? So that's the, that's the day one rule with the buy at B. Now there are some other caveats like, the $30 rule, which used to be the $20 rule, $30 rule states that if it's $30 or more, the buy at B is, is not used as a possible setup. You could still do a secondary setup. In fact, the one, I think the one we're looking at now to get long is a little bit higher priced and it's a pullback. It's an IPO pullback. So anything above $30 a share, I tend to pass on usually for like a buy a B pattern and then wait for something like a secondary pattern. Also, just FYI, and I think I mentioned this earlier, the reason I passed on this one, I just didn't think it had enough range, but now it's starting to develop some range. So if this thing continues to rally and then begins to pull back, which would be a first pullback, I would go after it. Likely. All right. In the last show I did, I think it was the second part on how to fail a trading. What I noticed in my intro, I said, oh, and a few ways to succeed. <laughs> and then I didn't really get to those few ways to succeed. So I wanted to circle back and finish up this series and do that tonight. So I'm, tonight I really want to talk about how not to fail at trading. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at that. Now, the first thing I would do, and, and this is the whole reason I did this series, is recognize all the aforementioned behaviors and don't do that. Like I've been saying last few weeks on the series, is things are brought about by thinking about their opposite, as any good motivational speaker will tell you. You want to focus on the positive. However, I think it's very important to recognize when you're doing these bad behaviors. 
So recognize the aforementioned bad behaviors is step one. And it's kind of like the doctor doctor thing, just don't do that. And as I've said many times before, and, and a lot of this came from an email I received many years ago from someone. And this, this lady was saying that she's like Paul from the Bible. It's like, I know not what to do, but I do it anyway. <laughs> And you you don't want to be like Paul, so hopefully all the aforementioned bad behaviors might ring a bell when you're guilty of them. And I've been guilty of many of them, and I'm still guilty of a lot of bad behavior. So believe me, I'm far from perfect. If you don't believe me, you can ask my wife. <laughs> you need to commit to commitment devices. I know I beat the dead horse on this, but one of the easiest ways to explain a commitment device is a friend of mine, he's a trader, and he was getting a little pudgy around the middle, like a lot of us traders are, middle-aged guys. And he decided to do something about it. So he knew a kid, I guess, friends of a family or a nephew or whatever. I don't know the full story on that. But the kid was into fitness. The kid was in the bodybuilding. And he said, look, I'm going to pay for your gym membership. And on top of that, I'm going to sit on my front porch at 7 a.m. And you ride by my house. And if I'm not on my front porch at 7 a.m., you keep driving and I'll pay you $20 for every day I'm not sitting on that front porch swing at 7 a.m. So basically he said, I'll pay for your gym membership. All you have to do is give me a ride to the gym when you are going at 7 a.m. every day. And if I'm not sitting on the swing on the porch, you get 20 bucks. So that was his commitment device and it worked out pretty good. I never followed up with him, but I know that he was pretty serious about working out once he started this. I think he worked out in his previous life. Now, one of them related to trading and sometimes you're gonna have to get creative with yourself. I don't know what's going on in your world, but let me give you an example of one of my clients and I'll give you an example of one of the things that I started doing. One of my clients, his office, assistant or whoever runs his office he's a doctor and he follows my stuff really well and he does incredibly well and he also he'll also trade a, like a lot of big cap tech whatever's hot in tech and stuff and he'll hang on to it forever and he's a really good trader and he makes a shit ton of money doing all that but he also has this affinity for day trading and he's a pretty damn good scalper not if he stays there all day long, okay? He'll make a couple thousand dollars in the morning and lose $3,000 in the afternoon. But if he gets in and goes in and trades around the open, he does pretty good. And he made a deal with his office manager because I guess he was getting aggravated with him. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I have to ask him. And what he does is when she tells him time or phone or whatever, she says phone, he stops trading, he hands her the phone, and she changes the password and then he starts seeing patients for the rest of the day and that's probably helped his trading tremendously because if you're going to trade in that kind of a hyperactive sense it's going to be really hard to to do that all day long mark douglas once said that he was working with a trader who was down on the floor and the guy can make a lot of money during the day. But then after about an hour or so of trading, he would start to fade. And when they started looking at his trades, it was like after an hour, hour and a half or whatever case may be, his trades just got worse and worse and worse. And so Mark Douglas and the guy worked it out where it's like, okay, look, you're, you're just gonna trade one hour a day and that's all you're going to trade. And the guy became extremely profitable again. He knew what he was doing. He would just run himself to the ground. So that's a type of commitment device. Obviously, that's for like the day trading and scalping and all, which we're not doing. And I'm doing, I shouldn't be doing, <laughs> but I do. But that's one of those things. Another thing, like for me, for instance, is you'll, you'll get these epiphanies throughout your career. And one for me is with the intraday stuff, which I shouldn't be doing again, or shouldn't be doing as much as I do. But I, I kept finding that I would come into my office after breakfast and I would 
get excited and just make some trades and then they usually wouldn't work out and then i would come back in here after lunch and make some trades and I'd get excited and it just wouldn't work out and then somewhere i read an article about this these israeli judges they did a study on them and they gave far more lenient sentences, like 60% less or whatever, for people who were convicted of crimes after lunch than they did before. And the reason was they were likely hangry. Now, I, I was trying to find the original source for this. I'm sure I got it out of like a Malcolm Gladwell book, or it might have been, um, who's the guy, The Art of Seeing Things Clearly? All these books that I mentioned here are probably on davelander.com slash books dash two dash read. I'll put the links down below. But anyway, uh, in one of those books, they talked about this, this effect and it was kind of an interesting, it kind of dovetails nicely into trading. You know, with me, everything kind of dovetails back into trading. <laughs> but it was kind of interesting is that I just kept asking myself, why do I lose so much money when I come back into my office? And that's when I realized it was after breakfast and after lunch because I feel just this urge to just jump in midstream on some of this stuff. And then it dawned on me that I was hungry. I was hangry going in. And it's probably not as bad now since I work out like a dog every morning. But I used to have some sugar issues where I get a little sugar low and I still manage it because I get uh, kind of spacey and hangry. You know? Like sometimes a wife will be, you're kind of grouchy. You need to eat. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, even though I don't need to eat, because it's like, oh, she just left me. She just left me off the, let me off the hook. But anyway, so I was able to learn that through documentation. That's something I'm going to beat to that horse on in a minute too. It's like, okay, why am I losing money? Why am I taking these unnecessary trades? It's something as simple as that. It's like, oh, okay. So now my commitment device is simply in my trading journal, I write W-I-T-O, walk in the office and, and come up with your own acronyms for your other behaviors or whatever, just so you'll recognize those behaviors and then make commitment devices. The commitment device doesn't have to be that big of a deal. You could just say, well, I'm gonna walk away from the screen because I don't wanna get sucked into trading a Fed announcement or whatever the case may be, you physically, remove yourself and if you're super brave hold yourself accountable to someone other than yourself i told uh, one client i was like look you know what you're doing a lot of classic stories here i'm i'm gonna i swear i'm swear i'm gonna get out and get some more stories but i, I told this one client i said you know what you're doing you just kind of blow up every now and then by doing all this stupid shit <laughs> you know we we we're pretty close and we have a heart to heart quite often and he calls me out every now and then too. But anyway, I said, you really know you should, but you do the stupid stuff. Why don't you show your wife my trading service, explain to her what you're doing and explain to her there's gonna be ups, there's gonna be downs, there's gonna be losses. And you know, for the last six months, this guy couldn't hit the ball at the park, but he basically told us to do nothing. And then look, we're printing money again, okay? And then we'll go back to grinding it out again. What was it, Brian Gelber? that said you spend three months out of the year and you're on fire and you can't sleep at night because you're on fire. And then three months out of the year, you can't decide the barn because you're so damn cold. And then the other six months you're grinding it out wondering, are you ever gonna get any consistency? And that's just trading, especially when it comes to trend following, but trend following is the only way to make money, by the way, in trading. So you have to recognize when you're doing these things, and again, commit to commitment devices. Now, what I tell anyone who wants to learn how to trade, and, and you know, maybe it's something I should do when, when trading is not going so hot, is maybe just go back to, to one simple setup and just do that. But if you're new or newer to trading or new to my methodology, just learn and learn and then trade one and only one simple setups. Find 100 examples historically of the pattern. Find some that worked. Find some that didn't. Notice what the market was doing at the time. Notice which setups worked, which setups didn't. Sometimes beautiful setups will work. I'm sorry. Sometimes beautiful setups will not work, but that's just part of the statistics that works out 
longer term. You got to get a stock that just doesn't work. That one in the portfolio is not working. I really thought it would, obviously. Otherwise, I wouldn't have put it in the portfolio. Now, I was talking to the Stock Shorts show about just trading possibly one setup. And it made me think about Linda Rasky's quotes. And then I found this slide from Trading Full Circle. Bruce Lee once said, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. And I see that over and over and over and over and over again. It's like somebody will come to me and they'll, it'll finally start to click with him a little bit. And then all of a sudden they reinvent the wheel, like we talked about last week and the week before, and they start, or two weeks before, and then they start doing all this crazy stuff. And then they end up on this perpetual hamster wheel, holy grail hunt, reinventing the wheel, the whole nine yards. And their learning curve just went from like this to like that. It's like they're starting all over again and they might end up perpetually out of phase for a long, long time. I've had people email me for 20 years and they just they just don't get it it's like they're off chasing the stuff and they're asking me about this guy what do you think about that guy i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that you know in one case i'm like just reread my first book and do something simple from there he's like oh i've, well, I've been meaning to get that book it's like <laughs> it's like what the f you've been doing you're asking me about my methodology for 20 years and you haven't even bothered to put in a little work and a lot of the work I tell you to do is free go in and look at the archives go read all the free stuff on my website go to youtube.com slash Dave Landry and there's probably 5,000 videos there go through those okay and learn anyway getting back to the one pattern Linda Rasky said all you need is one pattern to be successful and I agree with Linda so again, master something like TKOs, persistent pullbacks, and generic pullbacks first. That was from this slide from Trading Full Circle. And then I added to that our Landry Light pullbacks. So Landry Light pullbacks might be the one pattern like I talked about in yesterday's show. Now, I was fascinated when I started noodling with the portfolio that, and this was a snapshot from yesterday, BTBT was almost a Landry Light pullback. I would encourage you to do things a little bit more mechanically at first before you start adding some discretion because some of these patterns are other patterns that I trade, even though they're not a perfect Landry Light pullback, but maybe trade something that's a little bit more mechanical at first. And again, all of these were Landry Light pullbacks. In fact, that SIM, the last trade was a Landry Light pullback and knock on wood, it's working so far, but I'm not gonna get too excited with that one because it's pretty choppy. I mean, pretty volatile at times. And then the trade before I just showed you at $3,500 was a Landry Light pullback. And this one was a TKO. This is the one that's not working just yet, but I thought it would and still do. Anyway, so here's the SIM. You can see that's the last trade that we made the $3,500 on per 100K, that is. And you can see once again, it sets up again. We got stopped out somewhere around there. And then the next day, I'm like, you know what, guys, this still looks pretty good. Let's go back in. And we did. But that's another Landry Light pullback. Now, here's the EOSE. And not a Landry Light pullback, but a fairly textbook looking TKO. And let me just back that out a second. So you can see it was an accelerating trend, it wasn't a persistent trend. And then it had this nice wide range bar down. So that's a fairly obvious pattern to recognize. Now, maybe you want to start with the Landry Light pullbacks, and then once you're successful with that, then start adding into TKOs and persistent pullbacks. And keep in mind that patterns will be sometimes a combination of things. So in this case, it's sort of a persistent pullback, and it's also a TKO. But as I often tell people, if you're not successful with one pattern, you're not going to be successful with 20 and for some reason people just keep trying stuff now here's btbt and you can see it had a lot a lot a lot of landry light with the 30 ema and it didn't quite touch the 30 ema but that's a pullback as far as i'm concerned and also the trend was beginning to accelerate before it pulled back here so that's another positive it also trades cleanly okay 
I'm shocked at the number of charts that I get from people looking to trade, new to trading or new to my methodology, and the charts look like electrocardiograms, okay? You should be able to draw some simple lines in the chart that point in the direction of the trend, and then ideally you want to draw lines through the bars to show persistency and the fact that the stocks trade cleanly and so on and so forth. But you can see it didn't quite touch the 30 EMA, but it was still a pullback. And it was also a bit of a TKO, not a, not a textbook TKO, but a, a fairly decent TKO looking trade. And by the way, you can see that it also pulled back again, kind of the same pattern again, almost to that EMA. So that was another setup here. I'm just seeing that as I'm looking at it. And of course, the riot we just talked about was a land July pullback. And then Keith says, whoa, what a base. Yeah, it had the it had the mother of all bases. And I used to say the bigger the base, the bigger the launch in the space. And when I met Ralph Acampora, I told him that I thought I said it, but I realize you said it now. <laughs> so he's a new, he's a nice guy. I met him at Charcon last year. Cool guy. Anyway, so that's, again, another Landry Light pullback. So I was kind of shocked when I saw all these. Here's QBTS, which skirted that IPT today. You guessed it, another Landry Light pullback. It just took off. It starts flying away from the 30 EMA, comes back, gives it one little kiss. If you, are, if you don't know what a Landry Light pullback is, I used to call them kiss my goodbye, kiss the movie average goodbye. Well, I've got on me to start putting my name on stuff. <laughs> As I said, I need new stories, but we sit across the table in Italy, and there's John Bollinger. And uh, Marcy's like, who's this guy? I'm like, ah, oh, he's famous. It's like, well, how'd he get famous? Like, ah, oh, he developed an indicator, put his name on it. I was like, She's like, why don't you do that? It's like, okay. So I started putting Landry on stuff. <laughs> anyway, getting back to how not to fail at trading. You need to do your post-mortems, which is not to be confused with post-Malone. <laughs> what do you guys send me a post-Malone shirt? Because I made that stupid joke so many times. And uh, I had it on a couple days ago. People, it's so funny. People are like, who the is that? I'm like, post-Malone, man. Anyway, post-mortems, uh, post not post-Malones. Very, very important. I've been thinking a lot about these lately. And I think the true enlightenment comes when you go in and you look at a stock setup, you back it up to day one and you say, damn, that setup looked fantastic. I cannot find anything wrong with it. And it failed miserably, kind of like that EOSE. But wait, wait a minute, too early for that. It hadn't failed just yet. I just expect it to work out quicker. But you go back and look at it and say, you know, that looks great. I was not at I was not at fault for taking it. That should have worked. It didn't work. It happens. Okay. Spell with a silent S H. Oh hell, already demonetized. Uh, shit happens. <laughs> and, but that's like the true enlightenment. We're like, yeah, I'll take it again tomorrow if I saw it. That's that's a great way of looking at things. Now a lot of your post modems mortems will be, what the hell was I thinking? But that's okay. Okay. If you watch your phraseology, if you find yourself saying, I knew I shouldn't have taken this trade, then you need to do more of a pre-mortem where you sort of time travel and say, if this trade does not work out, I'm going to say, you know what? This was a beautiful setup. I would have taken it if I saw it again, even though it didn't work out, as opposed to, damn, I knew I shouldn't have taken this trade. The trend wasn't there, blah, blah, blah. And I've, I've actually written quite a bit about that and i'll be publishing all that at some point in time as it relates to the post mortems and but writing that pre-mortem is really important too now again along the lines of document 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 you need to document your trading obviously you have your trading journal i use a little um i have one of these i don't know if i have the link anymore i have a link where you can save 40 bucks on one uh but they only reimburse you back to what the thing costs. I'm not really that worried about it, but uh, if you want to save 40 bucks, I think I'm, I can find you a link. But I, I use the hell of this thing. Um, I've got thousands of, I've got thousand pages written in it, handwritten pages. 
on a book that I've been working on forever, and I've only had this maybe a year, and I've written a thousand pages in a year on that. So I just love it. And you could put tags next to stuff, which is kind of cool. And I write a lot of stuff in the margin, you know, like uh, I'll write, um, well, sometimes I'll put a tag YT. You'll do that once. Like if I do something stupid and I know I'm likely to probably do it again, it just serves as a reminder as what not to do. And these are things that I just kind of want to scratch the surface a little bit on some of this stuff tonight. And a lot of these things I'll flesh out in a lot more detail. But the documentation is extremely important. So in your trading journal, of course, document your observations. Uh, market's up, it's doing this, or this is happening. But you also kind of want to write a little bit about your feelings about that and and your behaviors. Uh, again, in the margins, if I drop an F-bomb, I'll, I'll make a note that I dropped an F-bomb and then I'll document why I dropped an F-bomb and why I'm my reaction uh, might be an overreaction or whatever the case may be. And then I'll tell you what's been a godsend for me, and that's where thousands of pages have come in. Yeah, that'd be right. That's about right. So I probably had about a year. I write three pages a day, got all a thousand pages just in my morning pages, then I got a thousand pages in the book. But if you wake up every morning and first thing you do is your morning pages, your life is going to change. And it's really hard. And I've told, it's like I shouted from the rooftops, people that I know, I try to get them to do this. And, and not one person that I've met or, or not, yeah, met or friends, like I meet people in the gym that will get to talking about different things. And, you know, I guess you want to party with me. Yeah, this guy's doing morning pages over here. <laughs> I do more fun stuff too, though. But anyway, it, it's really hard. I mean, you have to, I actually look forward to them. It's like, that's what gets me out of bed is, is to get up and write. And I love, I love writing, which is ironic. I used to cut classes, literally uh, quit classes, if they had any writing assignments, like a term paper or something, and eventually it caught up with me. And that's how I eventually learned how to write, because I had to. And I just kept rewriting this term paper, which was crap, one of the first ones I turned in. And I got an A on it, and I couldn't figure out what the hell, this thing was crap. I rewrote it about 100 times. And then a writer, or an English major, I should say, not a writer, but an English major, I guess he was a writer, he says, there's no good writers, there's free writers. And the morning pages will help your writing, obviously, but I'm not worried about grammar or anything like that. I'm just getting the three pages, kind of like a brain dump. In fact, years ago, I called it a brain dump. Julia Cameron, and I haven't read her whole book. I read the first few pages that talked about the morning pages. She wrote a book called The Artist's Journey. And then she did another one, The Artist's Journey for Business or something. And uh, I don't know if the rest of the book's any good or not, but it, it got me back, uh, reminded me to do the morning pages once again, or the brain dumps, as I used to call them. But in that, you'll be like, uh, you know, like mine might be, hey, I lost, I lost money again yesterday trying to trade intraday. And it's like, I keep writing that every day. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a minute, I think I'm becoming a definition of insanity. And another thing I've been working on a lot is is separating the extraneous and i've been doing a lot of writing on that too there's a lot of things that are influencing you that have nothing absolutely nothing to do with the markets and you're going to have to learn how to separate those things out and and the i was talking with uh well actually i was in the final bar yesterday with david keller and we were talking about these these things these extraneous influences and such and, and one thing in particular i was talking about is once you have a position on you have become incredibly biased so if you're long a position then you're going to be bullish and you might the market might be rolling over and you might you oh it's just correcting or oh, it's pulling back or oh, i'm just going to loosen that stop a little bit let it breathe a little it's going to be okay and that's going to really mess with your head for not seeing what is. And the more you document what is, the better off you're going to be. All right. Not as crazy as Joby. Yeah, we had we were looking at uh, some of you guys took Joby. We were talking about Joby in a group. Did you take QBTS? Yes, because I took it 
because I recommended it. And that's the great thing about doing a trading service is if I recommend something, I actually have to do it. And if I say, do not exit this stock, I sound like Nandor, do not exit the stock, do, don't exit the stock just because it's going sideways, exit the stock, exit the stock when it stops out. And that has kept me, I guarantee you, years ago, before I was doing a trading service, there's no way in hell I would have sat in riot for two months or however long it was watching it go sideways. I'd have been bored to tears or I'd have felt like it's dead money or I went off and done something else. But then once I started putting out a plan, well, first thing the trading service maybe makes me do is formulate a plan and then I have to follow it. So yeah, riot, the best teacher in the world and patience, amen. And you know, you should never hope, but I was really hoping that that, that thing eventually took off. One, of course, because I want to make money. Two, because I don't want to look stupid. But three, I wanted it to be a great example of why you need to follow the plan. Will it always work out? No. But longer term, you're going to catch the occasional home run that's going to make it all worthwhile. All right, let's uh, shift gears and get into crypto. If you guys want to ask about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. Also, if there's any crypto, obviously, we're on the crypto, feel free to ask about that, too. Bitcoin's doing pretty good in here. What's what's fascinating, and we can take a look at a few of them in just a second if you want, is that the crypto stocks are really taking off. The crypto stocks are seeing something that the that the crypto market isn't fully reflecting just yet. And I think the I think they're looking ahead to like a Bitcoin ETF on spot, on the spot, and not to not to confuse the issue with facts or anything or try to find rhyme or reason. But it is kind of interesting, the premium, I'm sorry, the discount is really coming off of GBTC. And GBTC thinks they have a pretty good case against the SEC because the SEC kind of willy-nilly is like, oh, you guys want to come up with a double leverage derivative on a derivative? <laughs> you know, it was like, was a double bit, bit X or whatever. That thing just got, uh, whatever you call it, fast-tracked in. And all of a sudden, it's an ETF now. Well, bit X is on futures. And it's twice, it's a leveraged derivative based on a derivative, and they allowed that, but they're not allowing a spot ETF, which is, which I don't understand. Your government doesn't like crypto, by the way. They're really coming after it. But I think it's here to stay. The only thing scary is uh, if, if a central authority Crypto's decentralized. If a cent centralized, like a central bank, got a hold to to currencies, that could be um, that could be ugly. But that's a story for another day. A two drink minimum story there, I guess. Well, not really. I just maybe a good story for talking to bars. But if you think about that stuff too much, it's it'll uh, it'll scare the hell hell out of you. Ethereum's waking up in here. I wouldn't rush out and buy Ethereum, um, but it is waking up. And Ethereum to Bitcoin has been lagging as you can see and now ethereum's starting to wake up so crypto in general is waking up uh i saw a tweet earlier ripple was up 30 percent. now it's up 70 percent today because i think the sec said that's not a security and it just took off i don't know why it took off because of that um the sec is is calling these things securities and then wants to regulate them and just create a mess for all of us but anyway, sometimes, as I often say, when, when they're moving, you could just sort them by the strongest and then just jump in the strongest ones. My ideally, ideally what I like to do, I mean, of course, if they're all running, I just jump on. But ideally, what I like to do is just use like the core methodology. And there was one from a few weeks back that I did get stopped out. I forget, I forget which one it was, but it was like a textbook sort of Landry Light pullback. And just one more thought, if there's, if there's no pairs you guys want to look at, as I often preach, probably your best friend in the world, look at that link. It's got me wanting to kind of jump in on some of these. Your best friend in the world is the 30-day EMA in these things. 
Uh, don't buy anything that's below the 30 EMA. I know I say that every week, but you'd be surprised. I mean, like, look at this thing. You can see it's just imploded, 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 well below that 30. No need to do anything there. That one's below the 30. That one's below the 30. So you can see just something as simple as a 30 EMA can keep you out of a lot of trouble. All right, let's go ahead and shift gears and hop into stocks. And again, keep your, um, yeah, Christopher, I think it is, and I'll show you why. So let me get the um, let me get the charts up, and then we'll um, we'll do that. In fact, you know what we could do while we're waiting on this to come up, if we go into uh, ACP, one of my clients was recently asking me about a week ago, wanted to know if IWM was a buy, and I told him, and then I announced in the service that. Yeah, it's a buy on the, he wanted to know if it's a TFM buy signal. When I created the TFM, the Rusty was not in mind, and neither was the Qs, and I did take the Q trade, and I'll show you that in just one second. So TFM, you just need two bars of Landry Light on a weekly chart with a 50-week moving average, and it has to close within 10% of the 50-week closing high. So this line here is 10% off of that 50 week closing high. In this case, this was all time high. So if it closes below that line and closes below the 50 day, 50 week simple moving average, sorry, 50 week simple moving average, you exit. So you exit would have been on that day there, that week there, whatever that, that Friday was back in December of 2022. And you could see that it, it dropped about 30% from that signal. So that's the whole idea of the system is to get you out of the way, but I also found that it's pretty good at getting you back in too. If you have a longer term kind of bear market like we just went through, where the market kind of drops and then consolidates for a long time and then begins to rally. Something like the pandemic, the, the get you back in signals can be a little bit late. Anyway, I uh, I went long to cues on this. It, what I've been telling everybody is wait for strength to to buy in because your buy signal was right here. And notice this weakness coming back down. I wouldn't have bought on that weakness. And so I said 190. Any close above 190 would be a buy on that. So I'd say tomorrow, if it's above 190, unless it begins to implode, that might be a good a good place to get in. Now, the only thing I would caution you with is the, the Rusty is, is pretty choppy. And you can see it's kind of all over the place. I would never rush out and buy a stock that looked like this. But vis-a-vis -vis the TFM 10% system, yes, it is a buy signal. That was the original question. If you're looking for a reason to be long the Rusty. But I, I wouldn't rush out and say that we're out of the woods just yet. Let me show you the signal and the cues. So I've showed the trade, let's see, we're on daily, let's get to weekly. I showed the trade not that long ago in the weekend charts, if you want to go in and, and look at a more detailed explanation of it. But the buy was right here, and I got in a little bit before the close on that Friday, whenever that was, back in April, end of April, no, beginning of April, end of March. Anyway, I got along at 319.49, and then we're at 379, so that's 50 something points. Knock on wood, but I just thought it'd be kind of fun. I know you're a part of me, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to to add some of this little bit of a longer term type of trend following type of trading to my portfolio. I wouldn't do a, 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 a tremendous amount of it. I think a small amount is okay. The longer term trend following that is, and if you, it's okay if you're doing it on like an index and like the, the spiders or something like that. I would caution you against pure longer term trading and not like a hybrid longer term trade. So right here, I just bought 100 shares. I know it's it's still 100 shares. It's, it's still what's that? Thirty thousand dollars, thirty two thousand dollars. But it's not a it's it's not like it's a, a huge position where I need to implement a lot of money management. I'm just following this longer term system for this particular case. On all those other stocks that we just talked about, 
I'm taking partial profits and the money, doing the money management, and all the other good stuff. And by the way, I did the, the S and P was a signal a long time ago too for the uh, TFM ten percent system. I'll uh, just show you that real quick. It was um, on that bar right there. So at uh, whatever that is, yeah, keep the picks coming for sure. Forty-one thirty-one. So 200, 200 points, round numbers in the P so far. Knock on wood, that's pretty good. Much better than the poking the eye. All right, let me switch gears. Let's take a look at the overall market, and then we'll take a look at your stock picks. We probably won't get too many. I know everybody just brings them up in Facebook. That's fine. S&P 500 closed at one year plus highs today. I'm not going to argue with that. And it's not too far away from all-time highs. Let's see if it... How do you do that? Oh, you got to hold it here. So round numbers, what's that? A few percent? Yeah, less than 5%, about 4% away. 4 or 5% away from all-time highs. It's within 10%, I think. It's definitely within 10% of the 50-week closing highs. So P is looking pretty good in here. We had this little bull flag a while back, and it kind of took off that. You know, Linda Rasky once said, markets will do the obvious in an unobvious manner. And it was pretty obvious that the P's were going to continue higher out of a bull flag. So what they did, they took off and they came right back and then they took off again. So that looks pretty cool there. That's the composite. Look at that. Bam. Banging out some new one year plus highs in here. Looking pretty darn good. I think new highs will beget more new highs. I think there's going to be some FOMO in here. Markets just wear down people, a lot of people. Uh, people were complaining to me recently, uh, like one gentleman on his way over here who I tried to get out of the market, but for some reason, my friends don't listen to me. I guess they I guess they see me. <laughs> Maybe they see me drinking beer and skinny dipping or something. And, uh, like, I'm not taking advice from this guy. I don't know. Anyway, uh, just once. Uh, I'm just kidding. But, well. Anyway, you can see doing pretty good in here. But uh, the point I was going to make is that a few weeks ago, they visited us and they opened. He's like, oh, yeah, she opens up our 401k on the way over. And, I'm, and, I'm, and she, they were freaking out about how bad it was. I'm like, how bad it was. I tell you, 30 percent higher that it was time to get out. And, and it's come back tremendously since you last uh, opened your statements. But that's a story for another day, I suppose. Anyway, NASDAQ composite, one year plus highs, looking pretty good in here. Rusty, as we just said, look at that, push it to the top of its range, finally. This thing is just taking forever to get out of the stupid range. I wouldn't start kissing each other just yet, but if you were, the question was, is the TFM 10% system a buy? The answer is yes. Now, keep in mind, I noticed that the, the Rusty's a little noisier than the P's, so you're going to get more whipsaw. But it does give you a good idea on whether or not you should be long a market or out of the market. Take a look at the banks. Very encouraged by what's happening here. As you know, we had this debacle back here, okay? And now they're breaking out to new highs, new multi-month highs. I'm not going to rush out and buy the banks, but good to see that they are improving. The regional banks were hit the hardest, and they haven't woken up as much yet but at least they're not going down and at least they're approaching the top of their range so that's a good thing financials which were dragged down by the action have been doing really well as of late so you can see they're right at these one year plus highs so that's certainly looking better and better mnc materials construction home builders banging out new highs in here that's a good thing manufacturing just off of highs, not quite, yeah, just off of all-time highs. So that's a good thing. Leisure's been doing really well, and Leisure's right at these all-time highs. Retail's been doing well as of late. As you can see, a little open gap reversal day, but it's been doing pretty good. Transports have been going up for the most part today, notwithstanding. Anything or most anything technology, as you would imagine, with the NASDAQ doing so well, is doing well in here. Software one year plus highs not too far from all-time highs that looks pretty good look at this little pullback here a little flag here and so far so good out of that the semis is one of my favorite areas to watch i love when the market goes up and the semis confirm 
that the market's going up or the semis follow suit or even lead. And we're almost at all-time highs in the semiconductors here. So that's looking pretty darn good. If you follow along the service and possibly even a week in charts, I was a little concerned about this sideways kind of kind of micro head and shoulder-ish type of pattern, but we did take out that pattern. When a bearish pattern gets taken out, it's bullish. And then um, somebody wrote about that at one point in time. I, I learned it from experience, but uh, I want to say it might be Van Thorpe or, um, is that his name, Van Thorpe? Thorpe? He uh, he called it hound of the Baskerville signals because the uh, the way they caught the I think it's a Sherlock Holmes the way they caught the murderer was because the the dogs didn't bark like a, there was a stranger in, in the house so they figured out it was an inside job anyway so he calls that a hound of the Baskerville signal nothing you could trade directly off of but it's a little tool you can kind of put in your tool case and like I often say. Sometimes you have a base and a market will break down below the base. And then if it takes out the top of the base, that'll actually test out longer term. And that's a, another little tool you can put. And sometimes you have a, a, a fake out, break out, and then first pull back. It's a great little pattern to trade. All right, let's hop into individual stocks. We only have a couple tonight, but uh, keep them coming. If there's some more, feel free. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Um, now let's 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 pick it apart a little bit, okay? All right, is that good? Yeah, it's that's persistency, right? Fairly persistent. And it's also kind of accelerating, okay? And it's a pretty decent TKO. It could be a little bit bigger, but I love the way it closed on its butt. Maybe a little bit deeper would be nice, or maybe another day or two in the pullbacks. That's a fantastic looking setup. It trades cleanly. It's in a nice trend. It's accelerating. It's persistent. This is what you want to look for in a chart. Now, the only thing you need to do is you need to back it out a little bit and you see, you got a lot of trading back here. And you have to remember that markets have really, 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 really long memories. When people start losing money in a stock, they tend to hold on to it unless they're forced out. Now, sometimes you can you get a stock that goes down and bases forever. That's one of my favorite patterns because all these people eventually get ground down, eventually sell it out, and then accumulation begins again. That's what I call a a phoenix strategy you might get a bow tie or something off of those those major lows but this is not the case this is the case where you've got a lot of overhead supply so i would pass on that but as far as a good looking setup high five if you're just looking at this keith but uh it's no bueno when you go a little bit back in time on that pan w for christopher and w yeah, that looks pretty good. Let's uh, let's back it out. Yeah, it looks good. Um, I can't fault you on that. The only thing I would prefer is if you're if you're catching something that's a little bit less. Uh, I'm not gonna. I hate to use the word extended, but something that's not coming off all time highs. Ideally, you want something at least in this phase where everything's kind of in recovery mode, where things are kind of in recovery mode as opposed to these stocks that are in super longer term trends because as other areas recover sometimes these strong stocks that are at just coming off of these all-time highs because everybody's happy they could be a source of funds okay okay john pointed out john always has good stuff for us john pointed out that the rusty is forming a weekly bow tie then that's really cool okay i'm like in nerd mode tonight yeah look at that that's a that's a weekly bow tie and you can see you know this is something i'm such a nerd but look look how cool this is okay these bow tie the bow tie moving averages 10 simple 20 exponential 30 exponential were all over the place okay and then they all came together recently and now they're in uptrend proper water on the weekly chart so if we get a tiny bit of follow through in here and then a, a one bar pullback that would be a weekly setup for the rusty let's take a look at spiders yeah spiders maybe not quite as clean it, it did kind of bow tie kind of bow tie ish in here what about the peas uh just flat out cash thank you for pointing that out john that's what's cool about the Facebook group. We have other guys and girls looking at stuff. Let's see what happened here. Yeah, not as not as well defined. The bow ties it didn't 
it's multi-year low, so it's significant, but ideally you want it to, to, to be a, like a big, kind of a big fat base, kind of like the Rusty did in here, but that's kind of cool. And then notice the bow tie down. Of course, it would have been a little late. A weekly signal sometimes takes takes a while. Uh, you get some lag in there. In some cases, it's okay. Like the TFM system, there's a little lag, but sometimes the market is not through bottoming when you're getting that, those signals. Okay, any more? Any more stocks you guys want to talk about? Any other questions? Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for attending. It looks like we broke a record tonight, so that's good. Numbers are coming back up nicely in spite of my... <laughs> not telling anyone how to find a show or anything if you do want to join us live david.com slash webinar and you're registered forever until i forget to put a new link in but let's hope that doesn't happen anyway i'll see all you guys and most of you guys and girls there's a few people here that are not in the group but uh i'll see most of you guys tomorrow and girls in facebook looking forward to seeing you there again as usual and everybody else have a good weekend and hope to see you again next week thank you guys so much you you're so welcome sam jeff george Thank you so much. I made a trend be with you.